So I want you to consider the following two scenarios that we've encountered recently at Rappaport. In the first, we've got a, um, a wonderful customer service representative in Ramadan for, for RapNet, which is the, our online diamond trading network. And she told me the story that she contacted a new client who had just signed up for RapNet to talk him through the, the new service. And she was trying to explain to him where to click to log in, where, she need, where he needs to put in his username, the password, to get him familiar with the service. And she couldn't understand why he wasn't getting it. He wasn't, um, he wasn't, getting, he wasn't getting in. Um, until after literally about an hour, she told me, that he said, wait a second, do I need internet connection for Adnet? <laughs> The, diamond, the online diamond trading network. The other, the other scenario that we've come across is we've got a good friend of ours um, who's a New, a New York dealer who told us the story of um, goods that he sent out on memo. He, um, he had a client, who, uh, a new client, who wanted a million dollars worth of goods that he was interested in. And he did the credit checks and he, gave, he decided that it was a safe bet to give those goods out on memo. Um, and lo and behold, the, the guy disappeared with his, with his diamonds. And so he took the story, he, he, he wanted to report the theft to the police in New York. And so he, took, so he went to the police and he told them the story. He said that um, you know, there's a million dollars worth of diamonds that are missing from his, uh, from his inventory. And the police um, started asking the usual questions, you know, how did this happen? So did, did they break into your safe? You know, was someone mugged? And he said, no, I gave, them, I gave him the diamonds. And he started to suddenly realize that he had to explain how this memo business works. And the police looked, his, looked at him or he felt they were looking at him like he was absolutely crazy. And these two stories really, for me, encapsulate a lot of what's, what's, what's lacking in the diamond industry. That essentially has been very slow to adapt to the changes that, um, that have taken place or taken hold in the industry today. And so when we, when we want to understand that place that um, a lot of the midstream feels stuck between a rock and a hard place, we want to understand where the diamond is, where the diamond market is today. We want to understand what's led us to this point, so that we can so that we can better navigate how to get out of this this sort of um, tight spot that we find that we find ourselves in. And so the good news is that actually in 2018, the diamond industry is in a good spot. We, we, when in, at Rappaport, we have what we, what we call internally the, the five liner, which is basically our weekly comments to the market. And for years, for years, people have sort of always come to me with a complaint that we're too negative about the market. We report, our, our statement is a, a negative message to the market, and I've argued to them that essentially we're reporting what's out there which we we'll explain, our job as journalists is to state what's happening as, as almost an outsider, in fact, as a, as a neutral party, how we assess the market. And you've seen in our five liners in the last three to six months that there's been a change in tone about how we're seeing the market. And I think a lot of that stems from the holiday season. That there, was a good, there, was, there were good reports out of the United States and China as well of jewelry sales during the Christmas season and the Chinese New Year. And, and these are some of the headlines that we wrote on, on diamonds.net. That Tiffany restores growth. You know, there was jewelry was a standout um, category at Macy's and JCPenney. <coughs> um, LVMH's jewelry and watch. And Division, Cartier, and Cleef all had good seasons. The one exception was an important exception, being Signet, but I really think that that was more of an of uh, internal issues that uh, that the, the company is is working to to strategize and, and and restore growth rather than a reflection of what's actually happening in the market. So what happened in the lead, in the run up to the um, to the holiday season? And you know, political opinions aside, 
um, there, was a, there was an increased wealth effect, or an increased feeling of wealth amongst the American consumer in the latter part, in, in the latter part of, of 2017. There, was, there were new tax laws that came into, came into, um, into place that increased the disposable income that people had to spend. Unemployment was down and the stock market was hitting record highs over and over again. So there was this feeling that we had greater wealth and more to spend on discretionary items in the holiday season. At the same time in China, where we've seen a decline um, from 2014, We've seen a decline um, after, a, after the boom years that what I think was really mark, um, a maturing of the market there, that there was a teething pain where consumers were getting used to Premier Xi Jinping's um, anti-corruption campaign and there was a, a, a pullback on, or, or there was caution amongst consumers to, to display wealth. Um, and that caused some caution in China, and, and we saw a decline since 2013, really. But in 2017, we saw an increase again, and we, and we saw that in the numbers of the big journalists there, Chao Tai Fook, Chao Sang Sang, Luke Fook, all have reported um, a return to growth in 2017, and, that's, and that trickled through to the, to the Chinese New Year season, which was in February. That uh, they all they all reported a good season, um, and and I don't think we should, meaning we should underestimate the importance of the Chinese New Year. For it, for, for such a long time, there was a kind of a, a wish in the diamond trade. You know, if only we had a second Christmas, and then the Chinese New Year came along, and that's really kind of given us that uh, that that additional boom, and that's trickled down to the trade. Um, the first quarter is traditionally a, a more positive period, or seasonally a, bit, a, a more positive period for the diamond trade, where polished prices um, perform better. Um, and this year's first quarter was, was a better first quarter than we've had in a long time. We saw a RATNET diamond index, which is a reflection of prices on RATNET. Um, so it's market prices, it's not the prices that are on the price sheet, um, but it's what's happening in the market that um, the, the rapid index increased by 2.8%, which was its stronger, strongest growth since the um, first quarter of 2014, really. So the question is, is that sustainable? We've seen increases in previous first quarters, but then the market quietens down in the second and third quarter, and prices soften, and there's this weird cycle that we go through of, of um, the, the, the market sort of riding that wave that, of, of what happened in the first quarter. And, the tr and we see that in the last decade, really, there's been an overall decline in polished prices. And so our challenge is to reverse that, that, um, that, down, that downtrend. In 2008, we know that there was a financial crisis, and that's where the, the RAPI index fell, um, and it started to recover, if you look from, from January uh, 2009 through to the beginning of 2011, I think that was really the jewelry industry's expansion into China that influenced that, um, that improvement in the polished prices. But then we hit a speculative bubble, which essentially was not sustainable and burst um, in the middle of t in, in mid 2011, and, and as we see in the RAPI index, we've been on a steady decline ever since. And it's very easy to say, ah, that's a correction from the 2008 crisis. But I think there was more. There's been more at play because there are other elements that are factor that are factoring into how the industry, the diamond and jewelry industry, operates. And um, and how it's uh, how it, and, and that in turn I think is affecting a lot of caution in the market, and and uh, and there's an overall adjustment in polished prices as we've seen. So what are those elements? I believe that 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 sustained downtrend is a result of five factors that the diamond industry has not effectively addressed 
and adapted to the changes that are taking that are, that have taken hold around us. And what are those five factors? The first is economics. There was a financial crisis I mean, in 2008 that affected the way we the way we manage our inventory, essentially. The second was demographics, that at the same time, around 2008, millennials became the, emerged as the core engagement ring customer. The third was that 2006, 2007 was really the end of the beginning of the tech boom, and we've seen this exponential rise in innovation that influence how we operate. And the fourth um, element is, is marketing. There was, uh, the industry stopped its generic or category marketing of diamonds and moved into branding, essentially by, by De Beers, or led by De Beers. And the fifth is an ethical question, is how do we ensure that any individual diamond is traced and accounted for along the, along the pipeline so that it is, so that we can ensure that it's ethically sourced, essentially. So I want to spend some time just going through each of those factors and see how we, um, how we've uh, adapted to them or not. So the financial crisis in 2008, and the major financial institutions failed. They defaulted on their loans. And the stock market slumped and everyone went into panic, essentially. If that's a fair summary of, of what happened in 2008. But the result is that consumers became um, much more cautious and they pulled back on the, on, the, on the type of goods that they were purchasing. And in times of crisis, um, luxury items are the first thing that, that people pull away from. So demand for consumer goods became much more selective. And certainly in the diamond industry, demand became a lot more selective. Before the crisis, we, the trade was in, a, in an environment of building up inventory and buying for inventory. And there was a, a much more diverse range of goods that was in demand. But as demand became more selective and, and consumer demand declined, the jewelry retailers were left with a lot of unwanted stock that they weren't able to move. And so they learned a very important lesson that they, they can't be left with that, that risk anymore. What if the market slumps again? That, um, that, they, that, that they don't want to be left with ballooned inventory. And so since 2008, retailers are, have reduced their inventory they're buying less, they're buying more specific for their, to suit their specific needs, and they're taking more goods on memo, which is an important point. And we see this in uh, Signet Jewelers, which is the biggest, um, biggest American jeweler out there. They carry the, the K, Jewel, K Jeweler Zale um, lines that you all know of. And in their, in their fourth quarter results, or their, their, their full year results which were released in March, they said two things. One is that they reduced their inventory, partly because, um, because sorry, they, they reduced their inventory, and, and if you look through their annual report which was published um, a week or two ago, they explain there that their, their value of their, the goods that they're taking on consignment has increased. So today, in 2000, at the end of 2017, their consignment goods accounted for about 27 to 30% of their total inventory. And the message that they're sending is that this is likely going to continue. As they are strategizing now, closing a few stores, they're going to need, need less goods, um, but they also need to be more efficient and answer to their shareholders. Uh, and one way they can do that is through, um, through memo. And I'm not picking on Signet here, but it's really a reflection of the idea that's out there in the market um, of this increased importance from a retail point of view of, um, of memo goods. So, but essentially it was a financial crisis. And the banks responded by reducing their own risk. The banks increased their compliance requirements, their compliance standards, the, 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 that which is necessary for um, for their clients to receive a loan 
and were undergoing and were undertaking a lot more scrutiny in terms of the loans that they were taking, that, that they were given. And they saw the diamond industry, the jewelry industry, as a high risk industri industry and still do. The, the, the trade has this, this long history of doing business with a handshake, with a mazal of racha, um, and that's the complete opposite of what the banks want to see. They don't trust the trust element of, of the trade. They want proper invoicing, they want proper financial reporting, and they want you to know, they want you to be able to account for all your stock. And so that's also that's also led to or that's also led to a corporatization of the trade. That there's more, um, especially on the jewelry side, or particularly on the jewelry side, there's been a move towards the big jewelry houses being part of larger conglomerates or becoming public companies where they're answerable to shareholders. And so their focus becomes on shareholders rather than the relationship that they might have with their suppliers. That's really where their priorities lie. Not that the supplier relationship is, is undermined that much, but their priority is to shareholders. And I think that's actually, that corporatization of the industry, of the jewelry houses, it has had a bit of a psychological effect on the diamond, on the diamond and jewelry trade. Because, and everyone wants to make money, everyone's, everyone's interested in the bottom line, but, but a uh, family jeweler is also more concerned about their legacy and will do more to protect that legacy, whereas a corporation will, in my opinion, will have more of a focus on, on the bottom line. And the result is that in the last 10 years or so, the big brands that are, that are mentioned um, on the slide um, are, all part of, are all part of big conglomerates um, or public companies, and they've gained market share. And, at the same, and as they've gained market share, the rest of the industry has consolidated. When you think about the independents, we talk about a 20-80 ratio, that the top 20 independents um, are, are strong and are on a similar track to improve their efficiencies and, and gain their own market share, but there's a long tail of independents that are struggling. And I think it's, um, it's a lot of baby boomers who are trying to sell to millennials and not succeeding and not able to convince their, their second generation that the industry is sexy enough to recruit them into that line of work. And so a lot of them are going out of business. With that corporatization of the jewelry sector, we're also seeing that they're raising their own compliance standards, that they want, that they, um, that they want um, their suppliers to vouch for their own goods, um, as, as Edward so elo eloquently um, uh, explained this morning with the, with the, in the role that the chief of the RJC is, um, is playing in that. Um, just quickly on the mining, in the mining sector, when the, when the 2008 uh, crisis hit, the mining companies uh, reduced their, their rough production, and so they, um, they set a new lower level of global production. The blue columns of, are the volume in carats and the line is um, the value of, uh, of production. And we basically maintained that lower level until last year where there was a bit of a spike as two new mines came to, came to market. But really that's the, that's the new lower level of, of um, rough production. And they're also selling all the rough that they produce out of the, out of the ground um, to, the, uh, to the manufacturing sector. They're not holding any back in their own inventory. Um, in the manufacturing center, this, uh, sector, um, in 2008, we really saw that the Indian market um, be take, take, take advantage and strategize in how to gain its own market share. Today, we see that uh, a vast majority of goods are, of rough is imported into India and they really are the dominant player in the manufacturing sector. So that's the, um, that's the first element, the financial crisis. The second is this, um, this new generation, not so new anymore, of entitled, somewhat narcissistic, um, me generation that's emerged in the last few years. And I say that in an endearing way, but as a 
Generation X than myself. Um, I still can't get my head around the skinny jeans and the lack of razor blades in the millennial market. But um, I'm actually here to defend the millennial because when you think about where the millennial was in 2008 when the market crashed, the millennials were by those born um, towards the beginning of uh, the 1980s. So the average millennial was graduating college in two, when the, in, was graduating college at possibly the worst time since the um, and looking for a job at possibly the worst time since the Great Depression. And they were also holding a lot of debt themselves with, with, with student loans ballooning in the in the 2000s. And so I think it's understandable that they've emerged as a more thoughtful consumer. They're not going to splurge their first salary on whatever previous generations had because they have a debt to pay off and they have, and they have a lower salary than previous generations. And so they emerged as a, as a more thoughtful consumer and one that's looking for experiences rather than products. Why waste your money? on something that's going to go out of fashion when, I, when my memory is going to last forever. And so they're looking for experiences and looking for products that are going to enhance that experience. And so it's become an experience economy that is driven by Instagram, where how you look and how you relate to your friends is very important. At the same time, there was this mounting pressure on millennials to buy stuff because their accessibility to what their friends are doing and what companies have to offer them um, increased exponentially. And that was because, that, and that was because of the, the tech boom, essentially. So tech really changed everything for everyone, but especially for, for, um, for the way we shop. Um, and, it's, and it's been in such a short period of time, when you think about it, Google launched in only, two, only 20 years ago. A few years later, Facebook was founded. Um, Google went public in the same year. Um, and Twitter was, uh, was launched in 2006. And at that point, if you think in hindsight, those, those platforms actually had very limited ability. And it needed a, they needed a platform that would en enable constant 24-hour um, um, accessibility to do that, and then this monster came along. And the, the first iPhone was um, was launched in June 2007, and we've seen this this incredible, incredibly fast boom of tech. I bought my iPhone 7. It was in March last year when I was in the Hong Kong show. I went to the Apple store there, and I was I was like the man. I really was the the pr a premier consumer for them. They welcomed me and this year in March I went to the same store because I needed a cover for my, for my phone and they looked at me with tremendous pity that I wasn't up to date with, uh, with the latest technology. So within a year I went from really the top of the Apple food chain to, to way, way down below. But what, that, but what that has done is that it's increased again our, our accessibility to products and it influenced this tremendous boom in online shopping. And we've seen that in Amazon's revenue because Amazon's, um, Amazon's had uh, exponential growth in, in, their, on, in their revenue and, um, and then being the, the premier online platform it's really a picture of what's happening out there. Now, whether it's at, at Amazon's revenue or elsewhere, that graph is only going to increase um, more in the future. And really, the diamond and jewelry industry didn't quite believe that it was part of this story when you think about it. Because there was always an argument that you needed a touch and feel aspect to, the tra uh, to a diamond purchase. And so there wasn't a real belief, I think, that, um, that the online shopping experience could, could, uh, could be fully embraced by a, by a diamond consumer. And I think that was a big mistake. The fourth element that we, that we mentioned is the, is the, marketing, um, the marketing element. And we saw in the, in, in the mid-2000s, the mid-noughties, as they call them, 
and the BS shifted its business model. It stopped selling diamonds on behalf of other companies, and mainly on Rosa, and so its share of the market dropped. It also started selling off some unprofitable mines. I put that in inverted commas because we see today a few of those mines doing quite well, but there was a strategy involved there. And most importantly, it informed the, the trade that it's no longer going to be um, spending its marketing budget on um, category marketing, on generic marketing. And so, uh, probably a year later, the Forevermark brand, um, which is the Beers Diamond brand, was launched in 2008. And really with that, the, the company was giving two messages to the diamond industry. The one is that it's no longer a custodian of the trade. And we're saying that you, smaller businesses, need to participate in this growth story. You need to participate in marketing diamonds to the, uh, to the consumer. And that, and that attitude really culminated in the Oppenheimers selling their um, remaining stake in the beers to Anglo-American. And so you had a shift from the beers being a family business to being a corporation. And as a corporation, their focus shifted to shareholders rather than site holders. And so that, was their, that would be their priority being the bottom line. The, other, the second message that they had in this shift or in, in this um, a shift to branding is that they were saying that consumers today don't want a generic product. They want a branded product. They're not relating to generic marketing like they used to. Not, they don't want to be told that a diamond is forever. They want an experience that's, that's going to enhance their, their, their own experience in their, in their product. And so there was a sh they, they were saying, you too, the rest of the industry needs to shift to branding because consumers want an authentic product. They want a product that's going to tell a story they can relate to and one that um, shares the values that they hold. And in terms of the values that they hold, the industry was still continuing this, um, con this uh, ethical debate that, was, that had been raging since the conflict diamond days. But it had shifted. It shifted to a human rights issue. And I, and I put here the Zimbabwe um, case because that was really the central theme that the diamond industry was dealing with at the time. That uh, Zimbabwe, um, after, a, after a, an intensive two-year period, um, when, the, when, the, when, the, when diamonds were revealed to be, um, to be uh, um, at, uh, at the Marangi Fields, um, the government eventually took over the Marangi Fields in an operation which killed um, over 200 people according to Human Rights Watch. And, that, and the Kimberley process was faced with the dilemma. Then what do we do with these diamonds? Because our definition of a conflict diamond doesn't cover that. It covers the um, it covers uh, rebel groups that are that are using diamonds as a tool to um, as a t uh, rebel groups who are harming people as, uh, in the pursuit of, of diamonds or using diamonds um, as in, in that equation. Um, eventually, the Kimberley process um, negotiated with Zimbabwe to get it compliant with the KP standards, but still the industry had a challenge of its own because America um, maintained sanctions against, um, against, uh, against the entities and the individuals who were mining those stones. So you couldn't import diamonds from, that were from the Morangi fields to the United States, which was the biggest market for diamond jewelry. And so, as an, as an American company, Rapport had its own challenges because we have Rapnet and we couldn't put Morangi, we couldn't have Morangi diamonds put on Rapnet and eventually sold to, to an American retailer. And so we went to different factories in India at the time and we asked the, and we asked the manufacturing sector, can you separate your diamonds your, your Zimbabwe diamonds from the rest of your, your manufacturing supply chain? And the answer was really many. It was some said yes we can, some said yes we can maybe, um, and others said we, we can't. But really that sparked a debate 
that's still going on today that is and, and that is whether you can track a diamond um, through the distribution chain and we've seen some progress on that um, at, uh, now which uh, which we're going to get to now so so that's if you remember that initial graph of the 10-year correction I think that the, the diamond industry through that period was dealing with all these issues, all these agents of change that was, was fueling so much caution in the market and that frankly it was very slow to adapt to. But I think that in 2017, one of the reasons we had a decent holiday season is because the diamond and jewelry industry has taken some action to to start to reverse to reverse that tr that trend and start to adapt to those elements of change. For one, it's starting to speak millennial, which is a language. Lol. <laughs> um, the the and, and I, I would and I think some companies are doing it better than others. If you look at some and I, and I always encourage people to follow Tiffany and Co on social media. They do wonderfully creative things. They did an incredible launch this uh, this last week of uh, of a new jewelry line, and released a a, a, a music track that um, that they've released to to the, to the market. But also, if you look if you look at Tiffany's um, recent conference call that they had with analysts, you'll notice a change in the language that they use, which I think is very exciting, and it's setting a tone for others to follow. And that language is one that says that luxury is joyful. Um, they keep using the words, you know, saying we're going to surprise the market this year. And so they're making it a lot more fun. They're also changing their definition of, or not their definition, but how they talk about love, which I think is very interesting. They've changed their bridal category, how they call, refer to their bridal category, to love and engagement, because millennials relates to marriage in a different way. And this is what their CEO said during the conference call. He said, the way people love, the way people express their love has changed and is changing. And we see a tremendous opportunity in that area because we believe that the business of love is a, biz is a business that will be there forever as long as humanity exists. Our opportunity is to evolve with the new morals of society. And I think that really encapsulates the challenge that the diamond industry, diamond and jewelry industry has, is to evolve with the new morals of society. When we look at those five elements, we're also seeing that retailers, jewelers, are finally investing in omni-channel. We have said before that, um, that they didn't believe they were part of that online shopping um, story. We're seeing in the latter part of 2017 and today, the big jewelry black brands and I think savvy independents as well, who are really investing in omnichannel, how they can mesh their online world to their in-store experience. Um, we spoke about marketing and um, it, last year there was a significant increase in um, the industry's marketing budget. De Beers put, um, raised its budget to 140 million, uh, which included a generic, um, a generic um, or category um, element to it, in fairness to them. And the Diamond Producers Association had its first year with a real budget where it could make a difference. And we asked um, the Diamond Producers Association, for those who don't know, it's an organization that was set up by um, the seven uh, largest mining companies to do category marketing essentially on behalf of the industry. We asked them, how do you measure success of your marketing campaigns? And, and they, gave us, they gave us an answer where ultimately, and there were, there were, there were various measures, there was a short term, medium and, and long term, but ultimately, it's, he said to us that it's when we see an inflection in college prices, when our marketing and our engagement with consumers are influencing Polish prices to rise again on a sustainable level. And he said that he expects that should happen within a three year time frame, which I think, um, I don't know if you'll go on record with that again, but, <laughs> but uh, I would hold that to, as an industry, I think we need to hold, hold them to that to really put through effective marketing. 
Um, and then the fourth element where we're seeing a lot of change and positive uh, movement in the, in the trade is on the responsible sourcing side of things that we, we're seeing really exciting um, programs that have shifted the conversation in the responsible sphere, in the, in the ethical, in the diamond and jewelry ethical sphere from being a, um, engaging in, pay, in just paper audits of companies that are doing good to um, doing audits of individual diamonds to ensure that at the end of the day a consumer is assured that its diamond or that their diamond is ethically sourced and where that source is from. And so we're seeing some very interesting programs such as the GIA's um, M2M program. Um, Edward mentioned a lot of them today. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, blockchain, init blockchain initiatives using, um, using technology to enable the, the telling of a story of a diamond so that will ultimately um, assure that the uh, that the diamond the diamond consumer buys is ethically sourced. But there's one element that we still um, we still come to terms with, and, I, and that's and that's where I think the industry is still going to go through a continue to go through a correction phase because it hasn't really come to con um, to terms with the new with the rebalancing of inventory that occurred in the in the 2008. Um, Downturn. And I think the midstream is, very, is still overcrowded. I'm not the only one who thinks um, that there is going to be con there's going to continue to be consolidation in the midstream. We're seeing some interesting movements um, this year um, of uh, manufacturing companies starting to partner with each other. Um, there was a news item on Diamonds.net um, uh, today that Al Rosa has been reported is considering buying. Um, Crystal, which is a big manufacturing uh, factory in, in in Russia, and so I think that consolidation in the midstream is going to continue. Um, is going to continue because the manufacturing sector continues to be under tremendous pressure, and essentially it's because it is the new gatekeepers of inventory for the on behalf of the diamond industry that um, as jewelers are, re are reducing their inventory requirements, increasing the memo, uh, their, their, the goods that they're taking out on, mem on memo, I mean, the polished suppliers need to be prepared for that. And, um, and no one else wants to hold inventory. The mining companies don't, the jewelry companies don't, and so they stuck with it because that's essentially their business model. And, the pro and part of that problem is that they're buying rough for cash and selling it um, months later um, as polished, um, often on credit, giving 30 to 60 days, sometimes 90 days um, credit, if they're selling it at all, because often they're sending those goods out on memo, and so they're only waiting for the final consumer sale, or sale to the consumer, to get their cash back that they laid out for, for rough. And I think um, we can also expect continued rough price growth. When you consider the mining companies who've reduced their global production to that new lower level, we, um, we also see a corporatization in that mining sector where they're answerable to shareholders. And so they need, if they're producing less, they need to increase their bottom line and, or their top line revenue in some way. And the way they can do that is through rough prices um, rising. So I would expect that to continue. And we've seen that in the last few years where um, the rough and the, and the polished markets um, have not moved in sync. We, the, the red line at the bottom is, is the, rap, the one carat rap here, the blue is rap ports, uh, rough price index. And we see that the, the rough market has resisted that downtrend. And I think that's only going to intensify. And so, finally, what, what do we do in this environment of change? How can, we, how can we navigate these five elements that are only going to intensify um, the, the strength of that storm that we're, that we're playing in? <coughs> so, first thing is that we all need to learn how to speak millennial. And we need to be part of the conversation. We need to understand that diamonds and diamond jewelry 
are an engaging experience for consumers and should be an engaging experience for, for consumers. And we need to tap into our role, the role that whatever our business is, we need to tap into the role that we can play in that, um, in that engaging experience. And if you think millennials are talking a different language, wait till you meet Generation Z and the generations that come afterwards. We need to recognize that the banks will likely remain cautious about the diamond market. We need to do what's necessary to make our businesses compliant with them. And we need to adopt, um, as a result, we need to adopt a more corporate mindset in how we, in how we operate. Need, at the same time, we need to know that there's opportunity in the family element of our businesses. As a family business, um, one that's protecting our legacy, I think there is an opportunity, for, certainly on the retail side, for, for the, the town jeweler, so to speak, to offer a service to millennials that's more personable than the larger corporations can provide. Um, we need to protect our profit. Um, don't don't give don't be too generate and generous with credit and be tougher on memo um, as a as an industry and also be more selective in the rough that we buy. Be very careful to buy rough that's profitable. We need to make sure that we're selling a product we can be proud for and that we can be and that we can vouch for. And and that is and we do that by participating in know your customer, know your supplier programs where your supplier and your supplier's supplier um, must be able to vouch for the diamond that, uh, that, they're, that they're supplying and also participate in these, in these exciting um, uh, responsible sourcing programs that are, that are being developed. And finally, we need to tell a story. We're a business that, we're a product that each diamond is an, in, is an individual and tells its own story. And so it's so ripe for the taking for businesses to take advantage of that because that's what the, today's consumer wants. They want to engage with the products that they're buying. They want an experience. And I think we're perfectly positioned to provide that experience. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time and patience. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them.